Hello, everyone, and welcome to End of Life University podcast, where we share real talk about life and death. I'm your host, Dr. Karen Wyatt. Thanks for joining me here today for episode number 315. In just a few minutes, I am going to share with you part one of a conversation I had with my friend Deanna Cochran, who's a hospice nurse and a doula trainer. And Deanna and I have both been doing this kind of work for decades now. So in this conversation, we take a really deep dive into hospice in the past versus hospice as it is right now. And we talk about the need for death doulas and a little bit about our training, she as a nurse and me as a doctor around end of life issues. And then we'll be back with part two next week to finish up our conversation. So I'm looking forward to sharing that with you. But first, a couple of announcements. Um, One is if you're listening to this live, As soon as it's broadcast, I'm going to be doing a workshop called Surviving the Aftermath of Suicide this coming Thursday, September 9th, starting at 1 p.m. Pacific, and you can still register for it. There's a $20 fee for tickets to the workshop, but I will leave a link in the show notes for this episode at eolupodcast.com, and you can look for episode number 315, and you'll see a link there so you can sign up and still attend the webinar. If you're listening to this after the fact and you are interested in hearing it, reach out to me and let me know, and it's possible I can find a way to make it available even after it's already been broadcast for people who are interested in hearing it later. And then I also want to thank my newest supporters on Patreon, Alex Letnick and Nancy Kendrick. And then also thank you to Joanna Dwyer for making your pledge annual. And that's a new feature now on my Patreon page. Instead of paying on a monthly basis, you can sign up for an annual pledge, just a, a one-time annual pledge if you're interested in doing that. And to learn more about it, you can go to Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash E-O-L-U. And there you can sign up and join our team and become a supporter. And thank you so much to everyone who's been supporting the podcast for several years now. So we'll move on to part one of my conversation with Deanna Cochran. I hope you enjoy it. We had an amazing time just talking together, sharing our histories and our stories. And uh, I hope you find it illuminating as well. So stay tuned afterwards and I'll come back with a few takeaways and to say goodbye. So here we go. Today, I'm so honored to be having a conversation with my friend, Deanna Cochran. Deanna has been on the podcast before, and we've known each other for a while now and convened together at a retreat center. And um, so I value Deanna so much, her friendship and her wisdom and experience. And I've been really excited for this chance today to have a deeper conversation with her. And if you don't know Deanna, she's a registered nurse with certification in hospice and palliative care who has served as a private end-of-life doula since 2005. So Deanna is really one of the pioneers of this movement too. She has been mentoring and training death doulas and caregivers since 2010. And she's the founder of the Care Doula School of Accompanying the Dying. She is also the author of the Amazon number one bestseller, Accompanying the Dying, Practical Heart-Centered Wisdom for End-of-Life Doula and Healthcare Advocates. And you can go to her website, Qual qualityoflifecare.com. So Deanna, hello, welcome, and thank you for joining me in conversation today. I'm so happy and can't wait to talk to you again. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, I've I've just been, well, for one thing, I think we've been kind of missing each other. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yes, we haven't yeah. had opportunities to get together yes. or see yes. one another. Yes. And so it will be really nice to have a deeper conversation. Yes. Yes. And yes. and I had asked if if you'd give a little of your backstory for anyone who's not familiar with you. And I know it does seem like everyone knows Deanna. <laughs> you, you know, you're, I don't a, know about that, you're a fixture yeah. in this field, but maybe if there is some 
someone who isn't familiar with your story, you could just briefly tell people what brought you into an interest in working around the end of life. Um, Yeah, so I can tell you that I was brought into dying, uh, into um, accompanying the dying or being at the bedside from my grandmother, my Walita, my dad's mother, and um, from Laredo, Texas. And I was down there and a woman that used to sell us candy uh, that lived on the corner that actually I learned just recently, they were longtime friends of my grandmother and grandfather who came in from Mexico. And so she, they lived together in Pearsall. They all moved down to Laredo and then they lived next door to each other. So Serapita had a little corner store and I grew up uh, going down there every year from Washington, D.C. is where we lived. And we bought candy and hung out there and she had the best ice cubes. And anyway, when I was 13, she was dying and my grandmother one day took me and said well I was laying on the couch in my jean shorts and t-shirt and flip-flops on beside the couch and she said um come with me almost uh, in Spanish I'm like okay where are we going she just said come on and I put on my flip-flops I didn't have sacred clothes on I didn't know where we were going and she took me to her house and I didn't know what was happening And um, I knew, though, as we walked through, it was remodeled, not remodeled, just additions, additions. And they all were, you know, going down because they were very short. So (laughs) the the roof was going down all the way to the back. And so I had to kind of bend down and we get to the back and there's women in black and with veils and sitting around in vigil. They were in vigil. Mm -hmm. But I could feel like I didn't know anything about, you know, energy or anything at 13. But I could feel a difference as I walked back there I could feel a difference and I knew something really powerful was going on and when we got back there I saw Serapita in the bed and I went oh my gosh I just knew she was dying something told me that's what was happening she wasn't just sick you know there was some reverence there and they were reading and praying so um yeah I got to be there and I remember the feeling that I had was of of, I was respected I was, I mattered that they brought me into that circle and I didn't feel like I mattered before that. So that was pretty amazing. Wow. That's, that is an incredible experience that it, what I imagine is that a hundred years ago, it was much more common for children or someone at age 13 to see someone dying at home in the bed and maybe people gathered around in vigil like that. But it's so rare now in our society. And they think you're going to hurt the kids. Like, you know, I grew up in D.C. and up there, a lot of our family, uh, Hispanic family was up there. And so we got together a big part, you know, big family parties because there were several brothers up there and um, my cousins and my wife and their wives and my mom and all that. But um, there was a death. I remember there was a death. But in my mom's side of the family, my mom uh, is uh, her, her she comes from British and Irish background. And when they when somebody died there, I remember wanting to go to the funeral and I wasn't allowed to. It was hushed. It was hushed. And I was and I'm like and I felt so left out. And this was such a a contrast, you know, and I was startled. I remember feeling that feeling of like, Oh, like, and I didn't, con- I didn't remember the earlier incident. A lot of this stuff I, I, you know, over my lifetime putting pieces together, but you would think after an incident like that, uh, being invited to something like that, that I would be uh, profoundly affected and conscious of it my whole life. And I wasn't, it was just something that happened. I took care of my family as they died because my tias did. And we took care of my grandmother and my, before my grandmother died, we took care of other people. And then when, when different people in the family would die, we would be right there. I'd be with one of my aunts and it was my uncles. Even there was an uncle that came, moved, Two of them moved back to Laredo to care for my grandmother as she was dying. So it was just in the family. Like you didn't think of it. It was just done, right? <laughs> yeah, it was just a normal part of life. So It was just it, normal. It, yeah, yeah, what people did. So when I got to nursing school, this is a long story, well, short story long maybe. <laughs> so when I got to nursing school, I was like struck in second semester nursing 
I was struck with, I had to do the hospice nurse rotation. They had uh, people from the community come in. There were 40 of us. There were only two hospice rotations um, for that. And I had to be one of them. I don't know why I felt that way. I was kind of struck in it. And what's so interesting is that I was a little detached in my studies there. I was always doodling and drawing up business plans for a remodeling contracting company I was thinking of. Because um, anyway, and um when that came on, when that opportunity came, I needed to do it. And I had people in the class also vouch for me, go to the instructors and say, you need to have her be one of them. And I remember now when I look back, who were those people? I don't know. I wasn't close to many people. So these are the kind of things that happen beyond my, um, you know, making things happen. And from there, I learned um, she was the MacGyver. She was like MacGyver. She, we went to Home Depot. We created things like an occupational therapist would do as your patient is declining and help, helping people figure out how to, um, you know, just adapt to their new status. And she, oh my gosh, she just showed me way beyond boundaries of what normal nursing was and accompanying. And then, and, um, I found out you should work oncology before you go to hospice. They said you need to do that. So that's what I, from then on, I had a plan. I was attentive. I did everything I could to learn as much as I could. And so, and then worked oncology, then came to hospice within six months. I was in hospice. Wow. From graduating. Yeah. Wow. And it just took off from there. That's amazing because I, I was remembering back in medical school, well, we had no exposure to hospice or pall palliative care didn't even exist at when I was right. <laughs> back in the right. really old days <laughs> when I was there. But um, I remember uh, talking with other medical students and they, uh -huh. they mentioned there's this woman faculty member and she uh -huh. works in hospice. She works with dying people. And we were all going, oh, wow. wow, why, why would she, she do that? I don't get that. Like, yeah. why would a doctor do that? Because is, aren't we trying to help people live? Like we, I remember yes. it felt confusing. That's the, the most exposure I had to hospice was that somebody mentioned a faculty member at our school and which is wow. terrible, awful that, that, that there yeah. was no experience or exposure to it. So it took me a, a much longer time to find my way there to hospice um, through well, all that training. Yeah. That you say that one of my professors, um, and we're still connected to this day, um, Professor Janine Jeffrey, she I think she's a PhD. She gave us a talk about death. And she was uh, she did a lot of work around, I think, disasters and helping people after death. It was more of that like that about the grief and after and, and death. It was just a death talk. And it was super um, intense and I was blown out of the water with that. But like you said, why didn't no programs even today? I don't think they even have a full class on dying or death. There's, there's a lecture here and there. Yeah. Yeah. Which is kind of amazing when I think about it. And I, well, remembering back to my medical school, we had a whole week on human sexuality where they showed us all kinds of Videos a, whole week. A, week, <laughs> yeah. a week on sexuality because they wanted to desensitize us so that any patient could come and tell us anything, absolutely anything, okay. and it would not feel strange to us or like, what? No, <laughs> like, no, I've no. never heard of that. So we had this one week of really intense training in sexuality, but that's what uh -huh. we should be having around death and dying. Yes. We need yeah. a really intense week so that doctors are no longer so afraid of death that they can't talk to their patients about it or ask them yeah. questions about the end of life. We need that's that that's a journey. That's a journey. They can't do that in a week, right? Yeah, so, I get that's true. That's true. But the, at least the pricking of the consciousness and those that are interested in a journey will do it because it has to be that the person is interested or else they're never going to, you know, warm up to it. Yeah. But like yeah. you just said, if there was a, maybe a seminar a month long or six weeks or like kind of what we did with community rotation and what it takes to be able to hold space for that, because in my in my experience and what I've seen with doulas over the years and what we focus heavily on is the personal journey that we must stay on 
to be able to sit with people in tremendous suffering and the awareness that we need to have of our own suffering and, and really care for ourselves um, in our life, like ramp up whatever you're, whatever I'm doing, whatever I was doing, whatever anybody's doing before they start to serve the dying, I really believe they need to ramp it up to a new level of care, uh, spiritually, emotionally, and physically, um, energetically, because you're going to be in, now you're going to be in situations that are intense and maybe before you weren't. And especially doctors and nurses, we don't get any training like that. And we're set, we're put into these very intense situations and not one patient a week, but several a day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, and I was thinking even of um, responding to codes when I was a resident and, mm -hmm. you know, seeing a patient coding and having to do CPR on someone yes. who was essentially physically dead yes. already but yes. we were trying to keep them alive and I just when I think about all of the emotion involved in that situation mm -hmm. and even the spiritual crisis the moral dilemma around it yeah. that it was yeah. never no one ever talked to us about that no one ever Ooh. talked about what it might feel like to you emotionally and spiritually when you're doing a code for a patient that yeah. was never even addressed and I don't know if nurses nursing school addresses no that. no it, it, well, I would like to know what they're doing now. Maybe they are, but I've not heard of anybody telling me about a program, nursing or medical school, where they even spend a semester. Like even if one class, they wrapped up all these uh, sex, death, like, you know, things <laughs> that might freak people out, um, have it all in one semester. Maybe that could be an idea. And, and then resources to continue the journey of awareness so that you can be with people there. Yeah. No. And given like each person comes into that training with their own history and their own background yeah. and experiences, but at least if they had a common body of knowledge to start yeah. with, like you said, like pricking the consciousness that might open them up to it. And you're, you're right. Some would probably be interested and get inspired yes. and want to do more. Yes. Um, and then, then they, then others won't, they'll want to go into a surgery. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, but they might, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. But it seems to me a travesty that, that doctors and some nurses would not be able to address death and dying with patients. It just does, that doesn't seem right to me because that's an issue that affects every single person that they care for. And, and for some, it's an imminent issue that's, you know, that's, that's coming up quickly. I don't know. Yeah. I get frustrated by it. <laughs> well, I, I really look at it like whenever I do a public teaching, um, I feel like public teachings, you know, they're great when you think about, oh, yeah, free public education and all that. But the thing is, you never know who's in the audience and where they are in process of is someone dying in their life? Are they dying? Um, did they just come from a death? Like I always um, have the consciousness and will say, you know, grief comes to the table. Every time you come, you speak about a dying death, serious illness with a, say a group, I'm very aware that, that, there are people there that may never have really dug deep into that. They might still be very raw. And when I think about healthcare workers, we come into all this just wanting to help and be helpful. Most people don't come in for the money because you can make so much more money doing other things. <clears throat> Excuse me. And our hearts are there to be make a difference. And the problem comes in is that there's then no time because the system is set up that you have to work real fast, practically running down halls all day long. And you doctors, from what I saw in the hospital, you're seeing hundreds of people like you can barely go in and out of a room. Mm -hmm. And so how are you going to have conversations with, that take time? Um, and that's what a physician told me. I interviewed a physician one time <clears throat> and they told me, I didn't, we didn't talk about this on the interview, but they told me that they knew that a person coming to their office um, was dying. They, they knew it, but they didn't have the time to deal with it. And it wasn't that they weren't conscientious 
or loving person, but they truly did not have the time to deal with it. And so they treated it as a flu and, oh, and wow. help. Yeah, I know. So that was like a dark, um, thing that they needed to work through, but, um, they told me that wasn't unique. So, um, I, and I think it's not because people are mean or evil. It's just, they don't have the time. Now that's, that's if they even have the consciousness and the skill to have a conversation with somebody, which most people have to really learn and train like in hospice, right? In hospice, they don't train us to have these conversations. You take your orientation, you come in, you take your orientation, and then you go out. And so if you're lucky, you have great hospice nurses that will put you under their wing, and then you get to talk to them. But otherwise, if you don't, you're just carrying your own head with you, with your own biases still, and nothing's been transformed. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. So true. I guess it's the downfall of training in in the midst of a really busy system in the first place. The and so even, yeah. even the training falls aside, falls by the wayside at times. And and all of that makes me see truly the value of death doulas coming on the scene because people who are specialty trained to have conversations, to take their time, to slow down, to sit and hold space with patients, which set that simply, you know, as you were saying, there really isn't time in our current medical system for our medical providers to be able to offer that, which is why we, we absolutely do need death doulas then who are trained to offer that. Yeah. You know, I really feel I was, I really feel that if every, see, it's getting worse and worse from what I hear is that uh, many of the old time hospice nurses that were really doing the training, um, more of them are retiring, right? It's uh, things are changing. And so we have new, a lot of new hospice nurses that didn't get the benefit of what I got. I mean, I had true blue hospice physicians training me back in 2000. And I mean, I was fortunate. I had like at least five over a period of seven years. Um, IDT meetings were fantastic. We learned so much. I had their personal phone number. I call them all the time. We had protocol, but you know how it is. There's all these outlying situations that Mm -hmm. you can't, protocol doesn't help. And that's the beauty of palliative care. But, um, you know, and then I had hospice nurses. I could call that, I call, I call them real hospice nurses that, I mean, would show up. I remember this one hospice nurse told me, oh, I showed up the guy, you know, he was dying. He was, he was actually dead within three days of this incident, but she, they, he fell out of bed and, and his leg came out of his hip socket. And I'm like, what? And she said, she went, she went over there. They told her, no, she didn't know before she got there. He was near dead. And she said, what, are we going to take him to the hospital? And he, what she did, she said, I'm just telling you what she said. She went and prayed. She sat in another room by herself. She prayed. And then she went over there and put his leg back in. I'm like, I don't even know how you do that. I don't even know how you would even begin to do that. But she had been a longtime nurse and maybe she had an orthopedic background. I don't know, but she did it. And then he died. And that's to me, you can't get any more uh, veteran in the trenches hospice than that. You know, like, I don't know if today that would happen. This was 20 years ago. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I was going to say that too. You use the term MacGyver, which I, yeah. I loved <laughs> for one of the nurses, but I remember so fondly being able to be creative in, I mean, yes. we had to be creative yes. in hospice work and you get called into a situation that you've never seen this before, but the family's freaking out and the patient's over anxious and, and you've <laughs> got to figure something out. So you, you go, you started asking them, do you have a fan? Do you have this? Do you, have that? you start yeah. trying to just yes. think of whatever you can Yes. that you can put together that you can create that's going to help the patient in the moment but yes. that's what made it such rewarding work because of yes. being able to bring all your creativity to the moment and try to meet the needs as unique as they were too in in every Very situation unique. yeah but 
you know, I think sometimes like I have this, these romantic memories of what hospice was like 20 years ago. And I, and my heart hurts to say it, but I don't know that it's like that anymore. And sometimes I think when I promote hospice, I need to know what I'm promoting to people because if I'm still talking about 20 years ago, I might be telling people, this is what hospice is like and what it does for you. And maybe it's not the same now. You know, I I have many hospice professionals in my program and we have coaching twice a month, long sessions. We do a couple hours and I learn, I'm learning a lot um, from palliative care nurses, even in other countries and long time experience nurses talking about what it's like. The main thing is they're fantastic nurses. And so I know that their care is good um, if you have people like that. But I know that I, as a doula, not nursing and, and serving families in Austin, that I have, uh, I, let's say out of 20, let's just say 20, there might have been like seven or eight situations I couldn't believe. They actually didn't know hospice. The physician was ordering stuff I could not believe, you know, things like that. And as a doula, I don't ever intervene or say anything or um, because it's not my place as a doula. I'm not the hospice nurse. I'm not the team. And it's not my place to tell a doctor or anything because I'm not in the in the office. But I'm, I'm going like, really, is this what's happening? And it's happened over and over. So I know things have changed because you would never see that amount of that before you would never see that kind of um you know not trained well before and I I wouldn't assume that ever and it's because I I don't know but I've worked at several hospices and I know the last couple that I worked at before I left in 2015 so I worked 15 years in hospice um the we had to train the doctors. The doctors didn't even know the rating skill. They they hired a medical director who didn't even know our rating skills. So what good were the IDT meetings for us? All it was was a Medicare passing through of documents. I couldn't even call them to to ask about things that were crazy. I had to call hospice nurse friends that worked at other agencies and then present it to the doctor. So I, I actually experienced that. Wow. So uh, it's disheartening to me to hear it, but I think that is the reality that we're dealing with. And so um, so I've thought that to myself. I, I have to be more realistic when I talk about hospice and what, what it does offer. And palliative care, too, actually. I have, a, I have great excitement about palliative care, but I yes. recognize on the other end of things, palliative care is still somewhat new. So it, oh, yeah. it's not the same wherever you go. It could be different in every oh. hospital. Oh, it is. It is. And, um, yes. we're, we're just at the beginning of trying to yes. get it paid for and covered by, yes. in, by insurance fully. So, yeah. so, you know, I just feel like I need to say something um, because my heart is breaking right now too, but you know what? I, I really do. I hear so many people say how hospice really saved the day and how much they loved it. And I know I still love hospice and I know that how good what they're doing is so good. I also know though, there's lots of physicians writing books. There's lots of people talking about other kinds of experiences. So I never want anybody to feel like if anybody's listening, that is like, what, you know, I want you, I want you to do hospice and try hospice because it, they're better than nothing. If it's a bad hospice, um, it's better than nothing because you can go from there to change hospice. So we talk a lot about in the program around um, being that advocate, that gentle advocate that I say, this is what should be happening. And if it's not happening, then find out, you know, go behind the scenes and find out, is it a nurse issue? Is it a system? Is it a hospice that maybe the hospice is overwhelmed and they don't have enough people? Find out where it's coming from if you're not getting the service. Um, And especially if the person's not comfortable. I mean, with hospice, that's the main thing. We know how to deal with physical symptoms. And I've been, I, most of my caseload, most of my 15 years was oncology. It wasn't dementia. People with dementia uh, have milder issues. Uh, it's devastating illness. The issues that you deal with are milder. With oncology, as you know, you're dealing with big stuff. Mm-hmm. People's bodies have been through the ringer and they have 
all kinds of surgeries that make their bodies so different by the time they get to hospice. And we had to really go outside the box. And I'm really, um, I've had a lot of experience with that. And so if you are not comfortable, I can tell you there's always something we can do. I can tell you that there is always something we can do because palliative care thinks outside the box and you might not like what we have to do, but there is something to do. And I take it all the way to palliative sedation. You might not like it, what we have to do, but there is something to be done. And, and you're so right, Deanna. I don't want our conversation to imply that hospice isn't good in any way. We, we can be reminiscing about the way things were in the past, <laughs> no. but hospice is still, it's so vital and so essential oh hospice my gosh. and palliative care. And yeah. what we need is more support for both of them so yes. that we can help them function at their fullest capacity and yes. have the staffing that they need and the training that they need yes. and the resources available. So yes. we really, we need all hands on deck and all the support all we can get. On for hospice. And, yeah. And I'll tell you, like, I think that what the, about the dual, you know, how as things evolve, you start to get insights and the insight I'm getting is if every hospice new employee, right. New employee came into a program. I, I don't know other programs. So I just have to refer to mine. I don't know. I, I, I wish I knew more about other programs, but if every one came through my program, they would probably save two years of having to get the experience that they would know need to know what someone knows that needs to know. In the beginning, you don't know anything. So it takes a couple years to really get in your groove. And that means it takes a many, many, many people to serve. And how, that's so unfair to a new hospice employee. So the reason why doulas are so amazing, it's not that they know more than hospice or they're better than, they're nothing like that. They're just companions. But um, they've been trained, like the people in my program, you give them a good year. Oh my God, they're out there doing big, they understand palliative care. They understand to guide people to palliative care prior to hospice. Most people don't die with hospice. So there's a lot of dying happening out there and they won't get to hospice or they get to hospice the last week or two. They've been dying long before that, you know, for at least a couple months, they're going down hard and maybe going in and out of the hospital. So I feel that every doula needs to know inside out palliative care. And I'm talking pre-hospice um, palliative care. And it's not the same as hospice care. And people don't know that. Not even health care. That, yes, that's so true. They, they all constantly lump them together as the same thing. So the doulas to me, where they will help hospice, you know, when I was chair of the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization, the End of Life Dual Advisory Council, what we what we learned because it was a the council's about learning what hospice needs and then sharing with them how doulas may be able to support, and that super clear that direction from the NHPCO around the goal of the council being educating the 6,000 hospices and palliative care organizations in this country about how to utilize doulas. And so right before COVID, the last um, conference they had in Florida, uh, me, Henry, and Suzanne went down there and we gave that presentation of how um, hospices can utilize doulas and how hospices can, um, you know, use the concept of a doula program without investing tons of money. Because of course, if you want a custom built program, you've got to invest in that. That's a big deal. But there's things that we can do, you can do as a hospice to take advantage of the resources and the doulas that are already in your community. And so with that, you know, I learned a lot in that role and I learned a lot about, um, what hospice needs and how doulas can support. And so community doulas out there, um, they hospices need our support because they're being squeezed for time. That's the problem, right? Mm -hmm. That's right, Karen. That's the pro that's why hospice nurses are leaving a lot of hospice because they can't possibly serve all the people they're supposed to serve and then do paperwork up until 11 o'clock at night and then take care of themselves and their families and be back at work at eight. It's impossible. 
And so that's the kind of thing that is squeezing our talented um, hospice nurses and squeezing our chaplains and our and our social workers and our CNAs. Um, and that's one of the things that we, I don't know what we're supposed to do to fix that. Yeah, it seems to me like there's this perfect storm of maybe increasing need and demand for hospice care because more people are seeking out hospice care yes. now than in the yes. past. But at the same time as we have staffing shortages throughout yeah. healthcare in every yeah. area, in every area, yeah. there are also all of these uh, demands for documentation now, which have really gotten yes. out of control, completely yes. crazy. Yes. Also in every area of healthcare, yes. way too much time spent on documentation and then the needs of the organization to try to survive in a competitive healthcare yeah. world. And, you know, all of those things come together and it, it ends up like you were saying, being almost overwhelming to try to, to try to carry on. And, and I mean, in the days when I was in hospice, we were a, just a nonprofit and we had tremendous community support and donations mm -hmm. and fundraisers and uh, galas that went on to help us survive, you know? Yeah. Um, but these days it, it isn't that easy anymore. I think, I mean, not that it was no. that, e that easy then. Well, but. think about too, we've got like in Austin, I don't need, I've lost count. I think there's over a hundred hospices. We used to just have one. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Yeah. And so the, I think we have two nonprofits and the rest are for profits, but I, I don't buy into the, oh, all the for profits are, you know, they have grown motives because I remember when I worked for the, one of the for profit hospices that I was so impressed with. And that was one of the best hospice doctors there, palliative board certified. He was awesome. And that was the only hospice. Um, I worked for them after this case, but I was a doula for a, a family. Their, their person was on a, in a, um, what do you call it? A uh, rehab, but it was one of those neuro, you know, was super serious, super sick. And he was on a vent and he was in there and he, they were trying to take him home and they called me to help. And, you know, I did my best to help. And so when I called all the hospices, nobody would take him on. He was hospice appropriate. I knew it right from my training, but to get somebody out there, they wouldn't take him on because they didn't want to bring him home on a vent. This was the only hospice. They were for profit. They met us at the house. They had the whole team, the executive director, the company, the home health that they hired to do the vent. Um, I stayed with them a few days and got everybody, you know, on board and everything like that. But that amazed me. That mm -hmm. amazed me. And there's other hospices. This other one I'm thinking of. I built them a, a custom, built them a, a doula program and nothing they had bereavement programs they had uh, aromatherapy they had all these programs that they paid themselves they didn't nobody paid for it but them and so i know that there are some um there are for profits that aren't trying to just make money you know yeah definitely definitely and and it would be totally unfair to imply that because it isn't really. But people do. They say yeah. it all the time. They say that's the downfall of hospice. And I'm not sure that that's true. You know, I, I, I don't think hospice is downfalling, first of all. But then they say that it's that. And, and people have a very skeptical opinion. But I, and I understand where it comes from. But I've worked for enough for-profit agencies that I saw the heart was there as well the physicians, the nurses, the, uh, the whole staff, the yeah. heart. Was and, and maybe like you said, it's not a downfall. Maybe it's a transition. Maybe hospice is uh -huh. trying to kind of needs to, to remake itself in a way. And maybe it's, it's on the way to transitioning into, into something, something a little different, yeah. but we don't know what, what that is yet. We don't know what it is yet. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's true. And I think doulas, uh, because I've been a hospice nurse for more than a couple of years and, and I've been dueling for more than a couple of years and I've been building programs for hospice. I'm, I'm, I got a view every of everything. And, and I'm very grateful for that because what, to me, the doula trainings, now it depends what kind of training it is. I'm saying if it's a thorough training, deep, thorough training, then that means there's going to be lay people out here helping their family and friends that weren't there before. So it might not be that the doulas are professionals, 
And I can tell you, there's a lot of healthcare professionals that come to me. So they're going back to their work, their offices, the hospitals, the hospices, and they're intensifying the training over there because of it. There's a lot of people that never will be pro and they're, they're helping their family members. It's just so moving. The Mm -hmm. one that, especially the doulas who will never be pro and they come and share at our sessions, how but the family finding out about palliative care, how that transformed their whole experience, finding out about, oh, you could do this or, oh, I can, you know, they have no idea how they can advocate. So I feel like the doula programs out there that are, are good. And there are many that are good. Um, they're training people how to advocate where people weren't learning that before. That whole thing of neighbors helping neighbors and, you know, your community stepped in during serious illness and dying, all that that happened before the hospitals took over and funeral homes kind of, you know, kind of separate, even though it's fantastic what happened, we can save lives and everything. It did remove us from the dying period, you know? Yeah, definitely. It took it out of the home and took it out of our kind of our everyday knowledge that we acquired as, yeah. as we were growing up together. I think it just took it, it took it out of our everyday knowledge. I, I don't think people enjoyed death any, you know, back then. I, I know that we romanticize about uh, everybody did the home funeral and, you know, put them in the back 40 and all that stuff. But I, I don't think it was ever... Um, Nobody ever like, I don't think people enjoyed that at all, you know? And, but the thing, the difference to me is like you just said, they knew it, they saw it, they knew it, what was going on and they had their ways of helping people in their communities. The communities were smaller. They were more connected. They might not have uh, wanted to be part of it or looked at it as a sacred event. You know what I mean? All these new things that we're kind of making people think about, um, I'm not sure that was going on. I think it was more like survival. Mm-hmm. You die. This is the nature of things. This is what we'll do to, to help it. Just kind of like in my family. It wasn't, we never, I mean, we did things like my grandmother had all the grandkids and we wrapped around the house, lots of us, um, in a line. And I remember she did what we call the benediction. And so we stood in a line, went through, we all got dressed up. And through the kitchen, out the door, around the block. And she took each one of us. She gave us, I still have my little, um, I think it was a Virgin Mary gold little um, medal medallion. And Mm -hmm. she did a blessing. And she gave us our thing. And, you know, I think every one of us thought we were the favorite grandkid. Uh (laughs) I remember going up there thinking I was the favorite. And then I'm like, oh, so-and-so, I know she thinks she's the favorite. (laughs) Anyway, (laughs) you had your time and it was sweet and it was powerful. And, um, but I don't remember anybody saying, now we're going to do this ceremony or now we're going to do this ritual. I don't remember ever doing that again. I don't remember anybody else dying where we did that. Um, So I don't know. I, I just think people died. You know, they got sick. They died. You took care of them. You, like my grandmother, showed up at Serapitas. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, uh, yeah. And and when you think about it, back then there weren't very many choices. Nowadays, I think what paralyzes people is that there are so many choices. Yeah. Uh, what kind of treatment or therapy you're going to get, yes. uh, or which doctors or which specialty clinics are you going to, which hospitals, what, and how much care, and when will you stop it? And, you know, and if I, you can afford it, and can, can yeah. you even afford yeah. it? I just find that so sad when I go to benefits, like somebody, you know, having a benefit to get cancer treatment. That breaks my heart. Why can't they get cancer treatment? Why do we have to have a benefit? Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's becoming so common these days. Yeah. So anyway, it's, it's interesting how everything's evolving. And I read an article and you might know more than me about this, um, that, uh, they said 15% 
of palliative physicians will be retiring, as well as palliative nurse practitioners, you know, people that would help them. And then we have what we're calling the silver tsunami of baby boomers dying and, and their parents. And so right there, you see a huge, like one curve, one line going down and the other one coming straight on like a tsunami. And how are we going to um, step in? Like, the stress of the system, like COVID has shown us uh, what happens when the system is stressed in a certain way. Well, when this happens, it won't be the same way that COVID did, but it'll be a new way of stressing the system. And I think doulas will be, um, I, you know how I see us? I see doulas, this is what I talk about a lot, is that say there's a doula, because they're all over the world, you know, there's not like a preponderance of doulas in one little city area, maybe mm -hmm. New York City, because there's millions and millions of people. But in any other place, there's just a couple. There's one here, there might not be another one in the state, but they're all over the place, but you don't know where they're going to be. But but wouldn't it be great if like a neighborhood watch for crime, if we had a neighborhood doula and then when death starts happening, serious illness and all this happens and everyone's falling through the cracks because the system's stressed, like we know what's coming, then that doula can help train, <laughs> educate and show and system things we can put into place and how people can help each other. I feel like that would be amazing. And that might be where we're going a little bit. Yeah. And you know what just occurred to me? Because one thing we talk about a lot is that death, dying is not necessarily a medical event. It doesn't necessarily right. need a medical approach other yeah. than on the periphery, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but if there's a shortage of people in the community who can help offer hands-on care for a person who's dying and help a family with a dying loved one, then the default is to turn to the medical profession for help. That's the only place people know to go. And if we could, like you're saying, if we had community doulas everywhere who were all, who were helping with, with all of these deaths that could be managed at home and that don't necessarily need a lot of involvement from doctors and nurses, we would save, save for the medical profession, those those patients who really do need special attention and special yes. care at the end yes. of life. But right now, everything is going into the medical profession. The me actually, you're right. Yeah, that's we a don't, great insight. Yeah, we don't have enough community people available for that care. And I, I wanted to say, too, I think we know that dying is a holistic event. I mean, it's the whole right. person and that that we need care that's holistic, that focuses, yes, on the physical needs of the patient and family, but also the emotional and spiritual needs. That's where I see the medical profession falls short. They're great at the, with the physical needs, yes. but sometimes those are, that's the smallest need there is. And then, right. and right. so I, it seems to me now this I'm saying, because I've seen how you train doulas that it seems to me you have a very holistic approach and your doulas come yes. away with a spiritual perspective on what the dying need and they understand the emotions of it and they can deal with all of it. And, and that I believe is essential, that training. And, and maybe that's why medical professionals could benefit so much from going through the doula training because they would get, I really think so, yeah. yeah. They'd get the emotional and spiritual pieces that they're not able to find that. You go to a medical conference anywhere and there aren't very many people talking about, <laughs> about spiritual issues at a medical conference, you know? Well, yeah, and I think it's like, to me too, like, Say so say you come into the program. Most people that come in, they want to learn vigil. You know, I want to be an end of life doula. They think in vigil, and they're wanting to bedside. I mean, that's just they're not coming in thinking I want to help people outside the system before they get to hospice, die well, guide them to hospice. I mean, they're not nobody's thinking like that <laughs> when they think about end of life doula. They're thinking about bedside vigil and the sacredness of it all and wanting to have, help people have a beautiful passing. And that's amazing. That's usually the doorway people walk in um, when they come into my program. So once they get there, though, what happens is, and I didn't plan that, I'm not that smart, but what I, what I tried to do with my program back when I created it and I spent a year, I thought to myself, okay, for someone to know what I know, they would have to work with hundreds of people, right? Who's mm -hmm. going to, who can do that? I mean, uh, how are you going to 
how are you going to learn what I know when I worked with up to 20 families a week for 15, at that time, 10 years, and then as a private doula for five years, how are you going to learn that? So what I thought was, what did I learn? <laughs> so I wrote down kind of what I learned and all the bedside stuff, of course, but what did I learn? And inside of me, I thought, okay, what questions could I ask that would access that, that I learned? And that's the personal journey part that they go through in my program. And so what I, and like I said, I didn't plan it because I, I really believe that we're inspired in bigger ways than we ever know. That's just my thing. Because if I would have sat there and planned all this out, okay, I could be proud of myself, but I didn't. It just, I was trying to figure out how do you access what took you hundreds, if not a couple thousand families to mm -hmm. learn well, it's, it's, what did I, okay. So that part of me that knew to listen, that part of me that took years, I, mean, I don't know how long to, um, assess that it takes them to say, you got to fulfill their needs. And instead of doing what you think needs to happen, like all those kind of things, how do you teach that? Hmm. How do you, so you have to access parts of a person that suffered, and you have to access parts of a person that went through dying and something worked, something didn't work, right? You, there's a lot of personal, um, your background matters big time in your personal experience so that you can become aware enough so that we don't take the baggage with us as we sit with another, that we learn how not to speak, that we just um, go and kind of be quiet and let them, we ha have this place where I call it, the pause, like the pause exercise is that I grow in my consciousness of pausing before I answer when mm -hmm. I'm with the family, right? So the practice like meditation that you do every day or every week or however people do their meditation, they tell us, don't feel ashamed if a cloud, if you start thinking all these things, just let it go by as a cloud. Don't be mad at yourself. Just let it go and go back to nothingness. Well, with a pause, what I ask people to do and what I do is I'll practice, say, five seconds. Today, I'll make a choice. I'm going to five seconds. I don't care who talks to me. I'm not going to answer for five seconds. So what that's doing is training me to be quiet. <laughs> uh <-huh>. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> when you want to knee jerk speak, right? People will say, I got this download. God told me to say that. I was like, no, most of the time it's not a download or God said. Mostly it's you being nervous. Your own suffering got pricked and you're trying to overcome it, your discomfort. Most of the time, that's what it is. And I've learned that from chaplains, you know, and I've learned that from social workers. And <laughs> that, That's a great exercise. I love that. Yeah. And kind of stopping, as you said, that knee-jerk reaction, which is oftentimes what gets us in trouble because we we haven't we haven't thought about what we're going to say first. And, well, and, yeah, yeah, and e even like there's a lot of holistic kind of practice, a lot of very savvy people. I mean, just because they haven't dealt with dying, lots of people coming into this work that are very savvy, um, emotional, emotionally healers they work with lots of people in crisis they're they might be new to end of life but they're not new to suffering or working with people and healing and all that and even them even them and psychotherapists lots of psychotherapists in the program even them they they even cry harder through the study than other people and i remember when that first started happening it's like chaplains and psychotherapists and shamans are they're, they're even more moved by this than other people who've never been. And I, I had to ask I, why I don't understand. I, I'm not judging. I'm just like, help me understand why you're so moved and you're crying a lot. And then, and one chaplain helped me see that's our, that's our training. Our training is to get closer to our heart. Our training is to be our authentic selves, to learn our own suffering. And so that we can be compassionately present. That's the journey. And I'm, and that's your journey. That's what you've created for us. And that's when I connected the dots. Wow. Oh, that's why the psychotherapists, the shamans, the chaplains are more moved in the training because they're already open. 
maybe that's why other people, maybe, you know, the more analytical people that have never had awareness training, they're in their head. Yeah. So instead of, instead of being in their hearts, which is, I mean, I'm trying to think back to in, in medicine in general, it does seem like we discourage people from crying, from showing deeper emotions. It's um, because it's not professional. Right. And yet that would show someone who is the most open hearted and the most available to be helpful to people. Um, Well, yeah, if they're on a journey, right. It's like, nobody, nobody could kick me into my journey. You have a very beautiful, I can, I mean, just your presence is so beautiful. I've always just loved just, I mean, you have a mate. That's your journey though. Nobody could have made you do that. Uh, You didn't, you know, we're on a journey of, of, um, I don't know, strengthening, softening (laughs) at the same time. Yeah. Right. And you have to be willing to do that. And, and, you know, who, you know, so I'm saying somebody who's more analytical, more left brain, they have to really want to soften. They have to really want to see, oh, okay. I want to be more like that. But I think the people that are real grounded in analytical thinking, um, they, they, they will never probably be very compassionate unless they learn just to be quiet. <laughs> like, do you remember, did you ever meet Doug Manning, the Baptist preacher? He used no. to do a lot of the plenary talks in the NHPCO conferences. I went to a lot of conferences over the years and he, for one like time period, a couple of few years, he was always there doing some kind of talk or plenary. Anyway, I, back in 2006 or seven, I did his uh, celebrant training and I went over to some, we were in a mortuary school and he, cause it was mostly, it was all 40 funeral directors or 30 and me. I was the only one on the <laughs> life side of things and they were all on the after death side of things and we walked into every day we would go to training was like four or five days there were heads like because it was a mortuary school so it was (laughs) crazy to me I'm walking in and seeing all these heads and oh my god and people in jars it's like ah and so anyway we were there and I remember what he said he because people used to think I was so smart I never knew what to do ever And all I did was keep quiet because I never knew what to say. And everybody (laughs) would tell me how much comfort I gave them and how I just knew what to do. And he goes, I never knew what to do. Wow. I just thought that was the most powerful thing. So anything to train us to be quiet, even a left brain, a rigid left brain person, if they were an introvert and quiet they would still probably a person would be, if they were looking at the person and being with, they would feel loved probably, (laughs) you know, because they're quiet. They're not trying to fix it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. Because there is, there's uh, being still and quiet is, can be so profound. Like those moments, it's not that they're empty moments. It's almost like they, they contain so much. They contain everything, including love, the, those moments of stillness. You know, I, every now and then somebody will say, and it's an honest, it's an honest mistake because we're all learning and God knows what I still need to learn. But it's like, they'll say, well, I just have a person with dementia and they're sleeping all the time. They can't even speak when their eyes are open and I'm sitting there and I'm wasting my time. I'm wasting their time. Nothing. I can't do anything. And you know, I remember, you know, it's a gentle journey with someone who believes that way, but, um, it, you, because, you know, you don't want people to feel bad about where they are and how I've learned how to, to do this is say, look, when you're sitting with somebody, they can tell when you're distracted, right? You're, you're on the phone with a friend or you're sitting with them and you're trying to talk to them and they're just completely this squirrel, that squirrel, looking up, looking down, catching the phone. Um, their energy is not with you. And okay, so when someone comes to me and asks about that, um, what I really want people to understand is that when you're present with somebody, they feel it. And how I know this is because we've done several retreats where I have people lay down, one person's laying down, acting like the person who's dying, and that they're unresponsive, so their eyes are closed, they can't speak, they can't move, they can't do anything. And then the person, the companion, 
is sitting far, not far, not right on top of them, but like about a couple feet away. And then the, the exercise is the companion follows the breathing of the unresponsive person. Okay, so their focus is the unresponsive person, the dying person. They're breathing with them. So now what's happening? They're connected. They're focused. And then what I ask people to do is from my heart to your heart. It's like this. From my heart to your heart. Like right now I'm doing it with you, but we're always facing. I don't know. I'm loving you. So my heart, I'm intending to send love from my heart to your heart. My mind, I'm saying, you're okay. I love you. Everything's okay. You're in good hands. So my mind is busy when it's thinking. It's doing that. That's how it's being programmed right now. My heart to your heart. And I'm breathing with you. So it's kind of taking care of everything that could go off track. And now I'm very present. And I'm not wasting time. And the person, every single time, the person laying down, feels the connection and they're and they marvel at it they oh now we do this a while we don't just do a five minute thing it, it takes some time and they feel it so the person who's actually doing it the companion they feel it of course because they're intending it and they're doing it and they're acting it out but the person laying down without their eyes open is feeling it too so i feel that if we can sit with people who aren't responsive Love them heart to heart, mind to mind, spirit to spirit. Just set up that. When I say intention, I'm not trying to be metaphysical. It's just that where your focus is, where your words are, where your belief is, there's the energy is going there. And now you have a full presence, no matter what they're doing. Exactly. And, oh, that's just such beautiful training that you're doing because you could talk about this over and over again and people may not get it, but when they experience it, that's something they will never forget. That is, that's such a if profound you experience training. That, if, yeah. If you experience that, then you'll never doubt again your presence. You won't. What, what a gift that is that you offer that in your training. Well, I learned it. I learned it from somebody else. It's like, you know how we are. We just recycle like the beautiful teachings all around the world. And you know, there is um, like every time I go do a training from um, a shaman or um, a pastor or a, a method like a therapeutic touch or a Reiki, I always ask. Uh, right now, I'm working with another healer, healer from the Dominican Republic, and I and she tells me she'll say, "Now you can't teach this for two years, or you can't teach this for a year. You have to do da da da, da before you can teach us." So I appreciate that from her because she knows I'm a natural teacher. Maybe that's why she tells me. But I always ask when I'm in class or taking some training, "Can I teach this? What can I teach around this? Show me what I can share with lay people." And that's so important because every kind of method, there is a part of it that we can share with each other. And that wisdom, the more it's shared, then the more confidence people are going to have that they matter. I think a lot of people think they don't matter because they're not having what they think are, are conversations that mean something like we're not talking about advanced directives. We're not talking about forgiveness. We're not taught. So they think that what their presence doesn't mean as much, you know? Yeah. That makes so much sense that they have an expectation or of a certain outcome or that they should be doing certain things when actually the stillness and, and the presence is the most important thing that they could be doing. The focus, the focus, that's what it is. And, um, there's a woman that I follow. She's actually a business coach and crazy. And um, I love watching. She's so out there. She's just so out there. And she had this one episode of, of um, not doing anything about that, but she was very serious in talking about how to be there for someone who is suffering. Because sometimes um, you'll have, you're, you're working with somebody like that. And I'm like, oh my God, she's fantastic. And one of the things that she said that I don't hear often in, um, 
in 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 our circles, we say all the things, you know, presence, this and that. And she said two things. She said, really hear them. Really hear them. I hear deep listening. I hear, um, you know, really try to be there and listen. She goes, don't try and be there. Be there. <laughs> and <laughs> hear them. Hear them. And the other thing she says that I love is she says, um, God, how does she don't ex oh don't expect any change or don't and I know we say that in other ways but I never heard like she kind of broke it down and even went a step back from the language that we use a lot in end of life circles and I liked it because it felt more accessible to somebody who's not in end of life circles and speaks our sacred language and all that stuff I can hear don't expect anything to change oh okay that sounds different than sit there with no expectations. I know I don't know why, but Karen, do you know what I'm saying? It's yeah. Like, let's break it down. Yeah, and I hear what you're saying too, that sometimes some of the things that we talk about almost become catchphrases or trite in a way because we've said them so often. So people hear the words and don't actually think about what they mean. It's just like, oh, yeah, yeah, be present, deep listening. Yeah, I know what that is. But when you say it in a different way, it, it wakes someone up a little bit to stop and think a minute about what that means. You know, it, I, I, you know, because maybe because I wasn't expecting much from her in that regard. Like, I'm like, okay, gosh, I wonder what she's going to say. Because she's so outrageous, right? I'm like, how deep could she be when she's that outrageous? But she was, you know, I was, was crying listening to her because she was so spot on. Yeah, and it's like, I, 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 sometimes I think, yeah, it could sound trite. But I think more than anything, lay, a lay person who's not in our end of life field doesn't even know what in the world we're talking about. What is deep listening? So, okay, fine. I'll listen deeply. Okay, am I doing it? I don't even know what you're talking about. Like the concepts are a little bit out there. Yeah. Even though the words are simple. The words are simple. But I like what she said, which is hear them. Okay, whoa. That hit me different. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. And it, will, it reminds me of a couple of things. One is that anyone... And everyone can be our teachers. We, there's something for us to learn, even about the field we're in, yes. from someone who who knows nothing about it. And then yeah. I remember, all I, over and over again at IGT meetings in hospice, I was always amazed by the volunteers because they would be the people mm -hmm. that sometimes would come in the door with these insights about the patient and the family that were who were like, oh yeah, yes. <laughs> like yes. you, you don't totally saw something that the rest of yeah. us missed. And so yeah. um, that, yeah, there's something about it, like we, about being humble too, and knowing that anyone can, can bring us wisdom that we need. Well, you know, I, like to me, what's happening a lot, um, you know, everything goes through, uh, you know, a growing cycle beginning and who knows where all this end of life stuff is going to end up because it kind of exploded right around like 2015, 16. It seemed like there was, it wasn't very busy or active. Um, I remember when the conversation project came out and death over dinner, I think that was kind of like around 2011, 12, 13, but that yeah. was just two new platforms. And then there was another platform around kids, um, young ones processing their grief dinner party. Or what was that? What's that? Called? I know they're still there. Um, I... But you know what I mean? There was only a couple. Yeah. Yeah. And then somewhere around 2015, 16, it exploded. And there's so many people now adding to the conversation from their worldview and their profession. And their, even when they're not medical, mostly not medical, bringing so, they add so much, adding so much. Like one of my biggest awarenesses um, that happened a few years ago um, I had a retired salesperson come into the class and I'm like, oh God, how opposite can you be? <laughs> Death doula than a salesperson, right? And in my mind, um, the person seemed lovely, but I just salesperson, I, my mind went to a place of salesperson judgment. Well, what I learned was that 
she was actually a salesperson that really cared that when you're a good salesperson, you really want results for your client. You really, you don't want to just sell them anything. You want, you want to take care of them. You serve them. They said sales is service. You serve them like, okay, well, we serve. Yeah, we're always serving. Well, the tools that they use to do that, the good ones, the, the real ones, they're the same tools that doulas can use. They're they're listening. They're not they're not going forward with what do they want to sell you? What do you need? Hmm. See, doulas often, um, not just doulas, a lot of us, anybody, um, often think, I know what you need. Because when I was in your position, this is what I needed. Or everyone knows that when you're going through XYZ, you need XYZ. See, those assumptions is what really hurts us as, as companions. And what I learned from her was enormous. Just totally different profession that I thought had was night and day from us. You know? I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Deanna Cochran. One thing that we talked about briefly during this conversation is that Deanna really has a broad view of the current lay of the land, so to speak, around end-of-life care because she's been a hospice nurse and a, a critical care and oncology nurse in the past. She herself has worked as a doula, has been a doula trainer and a hospice consultant. So she's seen all of the aspects of end-of-life care and so that's why I think her wisdom is really important to share. I loved our conversation about whole patient care and the need for medicine to embrace the whole person instead of focusing primarily on the physical. And then also that Deanna talked a lot about being present for our patients and the value of that. Sometimes the very most valuable thing we can do being willing to simply sit in silence and be present. The idea of breathing with our patients to connect with them and the exercises that she does around that in her doula training, and then also learning to pause before we speak, which is a valuable tool for all of us anywhere. And I think that's something we also need to learn to pause before we post anything on social media, because these days I see a lot of people reacting quickly out of their emotions and writing and saying things that they may come to regret later on when they have a little bit more time to think about it. So this idea of pausing, allowing time for stillness and just sitting with the moment and the experience that's happening around you, I think that's really important. So Come back next week and you'll hear the rest of my conversation with Deanna. And we'll talk a bit about this past year and a half with the COVID pandemic and some of our thoughts around that, plus lots of other interesting things. So come back for more of the deep dive with Deanna. If you enjoy this content, please be sure to share End of Life University podcast with other people who might benefit from listening as well. And it's also helpful if you subscribe to the podcast wherever you happen to be listening. It's available on iTunes, Google, Spotify, iHeartRadio. Stitcher Radio, and also now on Amazon, you can listen through Audible if you happen to have that listening app. So recommend it to other people, subscribe, and then leave a rating and review because that helps this podcast rise in the rankings so that more people can find it when they're searching for content like this. So until we're together again next week, remember, we're here for love. So face your fear be ready for whatever life brings you next and love each and every moment of your unique and precious life. Bye-bye.